Johnny Gould's Jewish State, the podcast of record. The UN has just thrown the Israeli hostages under the bus. Of course, they, they, they demand that hostages be released, but that means nothing. Since when has Hamas comply with anything the UN says or does? Not that the UN ever says anything against Hamas, of course. The war started by the October the 7th massacres is the longest in Israel's history. But with rockets still being fired from Gaza into Israel's southernmost city of Sterot and a first Houthi rocket landing further south, what next steps are open to Israel and what of the deteriorating relationship with the United States? Our esteemed guest today is Colonel Richard Kemp, commander of British forces in Afghanistan and a chair of the COBRA Intelligence Group, coordinating MI5 and MI6 during the London bombings of 2005, the Bali and Madrid terror attacks as well. Richard joined the army the day after he left school and spent 30 distinguished years in Northern Ireland, Iraq, Bosnia, as well as Afghanistan. Richard always delivers new insight into war commentary, and this discussion is no different. Iran is very much centre stage in Israel now. I, was, I had a meeting with the Israeli uh, defence minister, and it was very, very uppermost in his mind, as it as it is with pretty much every other Israeli official from the government that I've met. They're very fixed on that. They they of course understand that that this whole war and what's going on in Lebanon and the Houthis uh, and, and every other element of this war. Uh, is is under the control of Iran, is, is, an, is part of the, Iran's war on Israel. Colonel Kemp hails the success of the Shifa hospital campaign in northern Gaza as, quotes the single and largest, most successful operations in the war so far. The IDF killed around 140 terrorists from Hamas and Islamic Jihad, as well as arresting around 650 additional terrorists. He describes the evacuation of a million or more civilians sheltering in Rafah as possible and explains how instead of moving Gazans north into cities like Khan Yunis, why Egypt could so easily solve the refugee issue, but it won't. Not forgetting our hostages. Bring them home now. Where are they? How can they be rescued? Israel has never been more on its own. Colonel Kemp says Hamas has been emboldened by the UN Security Council resolution, which called for a ceasefire and for the freeing of hostages. But to Israel's fury, did not hinge the ceasefire demand on freeing them. Of course, Hamas won't lower its hardline ceasefire demands. When did they ever comply with anything the UN or anyone demanded of them? Yet there is a military alternative to going into Rafah. With world opinion led by the UN and the Biden administration squarely against Israel finishing off Hamas on their terms, Richard explains the options open to Israel, which you're not hearing about in the media. You're going to hear it here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Plus, the unreported cooperation between Israel and Egypt, who also share a border with Gaza beyond Rafa. This episode is presented with the cooperation and support of Elnet UK, a bipartisan cross-party international organization working to advance UK-Israel relations based on shared democratic values and strategic interests. Starting it all off is Chief Executive of Elnet UK, the Right Honourable Joan Ryan. Welcome, uh, Richard. Um, is it okay to call you Richard or do you want me to call you Colonel Richard? <laughs> Uh, oh, Richard is good. I've been called a lot worse things than that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, a lot happening and a lot happening today. First and foremost, you were an expert in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, like few others, and you've overseen military operations in the Middle East and advised nation states on intelligence. With this experience, can you tell us a bit about the scale and nature of the military challenge faced by Israel in Gaza? How unprecedented is the challenge and does it have parallels with other conflicts that you've been either involved with or aware of? First of all, thank you very much for the question and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I follow the work of Elnet very closely. It's a very 
important organization. I'm grateful to be invited to join you. I, I, I would say there are, there are quite a few similarities with what's happened in, in the past, including my own experiences, but most of them are more on a tactical level. There's sort of similar tactics used by both uh, the enemies that we've had to fight and by our own forces compared to the IDF's tactics. Uh, on a higher level, on a more strategic level, I think this conflict is probably unprecedented uh, in in the um, the the the, the, the uh, existential nature of this war for Israel. Uh, if Israel Israel had its very existence threatened on the seventh of October, and if it hadn't responded in the way that it did, then you know, there would have been little hope for the future of Israel. And, and it's, of course, not just in relation to Gaza, but in relation to what's going on in the north in, with Hezbollah in Lebanon, Iranian proxies in Syria, uh, in Jordan, Iraq, and, of course, in Yemen and other places. So it's a, it's a very wide-ranging threat against a small country uh, with enormous power behind that threat. Uh, and and in, in order to... Um, to deal with the threat, Israel had no choice at all other than to carry out a full-scale military operation against Gaza. And it's not just, that operation is not just against Gaza. It also will have repercussions for the other threats Israel faces. For example, the enormous damage that Israel has done to Hamas in the last few months uh, is a message that has been received by Hezbollah in Lebanon and are therefore able to, or therefore I think that explains to an extent their relative restraint. They've carried, carried out an intensive campaign, but not as intensive as they could have done. So I think this has enormous repercussions. But one other thing I would say is that the, um, the, the complexities are immense and not just tactical complexities, the fact that Hamas have uh, had decades to prepare the ground, expecting Israel to move in at some point. Decades to prepare the ground with um, booby traps, ambush positions, fortified locations, as well as hundreds of miles of tunnels underneath Gaza. The hostages are another complexity that, that few other conflicts have involved. And of course, the enormous, very high, de very high density civilian population. So all of the th these things go into making it a very, very difficult situation. But the reality is if Israel does not win this war, it's not really like Afghanistan, for example, or Iraq, where uh, our, our, we, we didn't win in, in, in classical terms. We didn't win either of those two campaigns. We achieved a great deal in them. We didn't win them. The immediate repercussions of those two uh, failures on our part were not... Um, uh, as devastating as the repercussions would be of this failure, we have seen if this was if this became a failure, we have seen, um, for example, in relation to Afghanistan, we've seen the repercussions of that, and it's included, I think, giving Putin a green light to invade Ukraine by seeing the weakness of the West in Afghanistan. It's given uh, a, a, a safe haven for terrorist organizations like Islamic State to train, to plan, to prepare. And we saw again, almost certainly the outcome of that in Moscow a few days ago. So these are repercussions, but the repercussion for Israel would be far, far more serious than that. How plausible is it then to think that Israel could have undertaken a different kind of campaign against Hamas? Um, is it, were there a limited number of options? Were there any other options? The, the only other option would be surrender. Uh, I've heard many um, military experts, whether they're former soldiers or airmen or academic experts, I've heard many people saying what Israel should do or that Israel should be doing something different. They should not be carrying out such an intensive ground campaign and air campaign as they have been. One thing I have not heard, and I've asked many, many experts the question, I've not heard them tell me how exactly Israel should do it in any way that is even vaguely realistic. I think the Americans, for example, um, at one point, the American military recommended that Israel should follow the US example in Afghanistan of carrying out 
targeted raids against Hamas. And British military experts have said the same thing, including former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, who said that Israel should follow Britain's example in Northern Ireland. Of course, both of those campaigns, particularly the Iraq campaign, uh, targeted raids did not succeed. Targeted raids may have done damage to the enemy, but they did not succeed. And it would be entirely unrealistic to have expected Israel to fight the war like that because of the the, the enormous intensive opposition on the ground. And we saw, for example, one, what, we saw one example of a, a, a raid into Rafa not so long ago in which the IDF rescued a, a hostage from Rafa. And, and, and we saw the huge firefight that ensued after that. It, this is not the, the, this is not a theater where it's possible to carry out surgical strikes and, and, you know, surgical raids, uh, to, to eliminate specific capabilities or particular leaders. This is a, this is a, a, essentially, this is not, this is not what we had in Afghanistan and Iraq and indeed Northern Ireland. This is not a counterinsurgency campaign. This is an all out war. The IDF versus a terror army, not not an insurgent organization, but effectively the army of a state, if you would call, if you consider Gaza to have been a state, which in practice it was, it was a, a, a almost an independent state. So, no, I don't believe that the IDF had any choice, to, no matter how painful it was. And I think they knew in advance, the Israelis knew in advance how tough it would be, particularly on the civilian population in Gaza. Uh, and that's why they refrained in the past from launching a really sustained campaign into Gaza at any time during the last decade or two. It's the longest in Israel's history. How do you think Israel has fared then in terms of its tactical gains and the combatant to civilian casualty ratio, which has been discussed and criticised so often uh, by Israel's international allies? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as a as a former professional soldier, I, I I I would say that the IDF has done an absolutely outstanding job inside Gaza since this campaign began. I've been on the ground in Gaza myself during the land during the ground campaign on a number of occasions. I've witnessed with my own eyes the way that Israel is fighting this war, and it is extremely impressive. The, I mentioned the complexities that they've got, and one of the greatest problems, perhaps the most d dramatic problem, is is having to fight in these tunnels as well. I think before the war began, the IDF made a decision they would not, they would avoid fighting in the tunnels. When they when it came down to it, they had little choice given the really extensive tunnel network and the fact that most of Hamas was underground. So they very rapidly developed some extremely effective tactics for dealing with that, as well as Hamas above ground. And, and the outcome of it so far has been a very significant proportion of the Hamas fighting strength and military capability has been destroyed by Israel. Estimates vary, but you know, maybe between 50 and 70 percent, perhaps closer to 70 percent or more of Hamas's military capability has been taken out so far. Uh, and that equates to, I think, the IDF estimate that they've killed around 13,000 Hamas terrorists in the war so far which is, I think, a very significant achievement and, and taken many, many prisoners and have also gained vast amounts of intelligence from interrogation of prisoners, from documents, computers seized, etc., which has then given them a further edge. Uh, and the, the, against this progress, um, we've, we've seen, I think, just over 250 IDF soldiers killed which is, again, quite a phenomenal achievement. I know this is not a, a sort of um, a symmetrical war in, in, the, in the sense of World War II or something like that. But as an, even as an asymmetrical war, we've, we've you know, for, for an attacking force to lose only just over 250 soldiers, which is each one is a tragic loss, of course, particularly to them and their families. Um, against uh, an, an enemy death rate of 13,000, it normally would be without somewhere close to the opposite of that in, in a for an attacking force so that's extremely i think extremely effective there remains uh the problem of rafa which we'll probably talk about in a bit but uh on the civilian casualty side this is one of the most important uh features of this war i think given the huge and understandable focus of the international community on civilian casualties 
And what one has to remember is that Hamas, its entire strategy is based on its civilian population. Its entire strategy is based on trying to compel the IDF to kill as many of its own civilians as possible. It's probably the only army in history, if you call Hamas an army, that has wanted its enemy to kill its own civilian population. But that's exactly what Hamas wants. It's the basis of every single offensive operation Hamas has ever launched against Israel to get retaliation, which results in civilian casualties, which in turn results in condemnation, vilification, isolation of Israel and the world community. So it's, you know, that you have to bear that in mind when you look at casualty figures that other enemy, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan and Iraq, Northern Ireland, the, the insurgents there did not try to get the coalition forces, British forces, etc., to kill their own civilian population. Uh, because of this, Israel, of course, has, Israel understands this, and Israel has developed probably the most comprehensive and effective means in the history of warfare to minimise civilian casualties among its own population. But suffice it to say that they take unprecedented steps to minimize civilian casualties. And what, what we, we don't really know the ratio between civilian casualties and combatant casualties, very difficult to work out. But if you if you do go on Hamas's figures for the total number dead in Gaza, which I think are unreliable, but they're estimating somewhere around 30, 35,000 have been killed. If, if, if we assume for a second that that is accurate, and I don't know whether it is or not, it's, it's the figures are very, very badly flawed that they give. But of course, that, that number does include uh, Hamas terrorists and other terrorists in Gaza, which uh, Hamas, of course, do not admit to, but it does include that, if that's the correct figure. And if we take Israel as, as let's say, having killed 15,000, 13,000 of Hamas terrorists, then that gives a, a ratio, very, very roughly speaking, of about just over one, maybe 1 1.2, something of like that, to one, 1 1.2 civilians for every terrorist killed, give or take. I'm not, I'm not standing by the accuracy of that figure, but it's, it's a rough guide. Uh, and, and, and we, we need to compare that to other conflicts. The UN issued a report a number of years ago saying that in urban conflict around the world since the Second World War, a total of nine civilians were killed for every one combatant killed. I don't know if that figure is accurate. The UN have said it is. Other people dispute it. But in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were looking at around 1.5 uh, to, to 2 to 1, 1 1.5 civilians to 2 combatants killed. So Israel's ratio in this conflict, when don't forget Hamas is trying to get them to kill innocent civilians, certainly seems to me, tragic though it is, every, every civilian death is a tragedy, but it certainly seems to be a great deal better than uh, we have managed to achieve in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and, and almost the opposite of what the world is accusing Israel of doing. I've seen analysis of these stats that each day, as Hamas puts them out and they go up, it seems to be uh, the same number of women and children who are killed each day and added to it. And uh, analysts of this, statistical analysis and experts say that just isn't what would happen and how statistics work. You'd have a varying number each day. We'd never have this even rise. Um, I think one thing we do know, though, is the uh, the PR battle waged by Hamas and its allies has been very successful. Yeah, and, it, and it, of course, that PR battle has been developed over many, many decades now and, and has become the accepted truth for so many people around the world, including the United Nations, uh, the EU, many other international bodies, uh, universities, student organizations, professors, you, you name it. They, 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 they've simply swallowed hook, line and sinker mm. a, a propaganda campaign that, that amounts to probably the world's worst, most effective ever slur campaign in history. Mm. Uh, and, and it's very, very hard to break through that because people simply don't want to hear the truth. They're not interested in the reality. They're only interested in this narrative. Whatever Israel, whatever happened to Israel on the 7th of October, Israel had it coming. Even the UN Secretary General pretty much implied that in his remarks a while back. And whatever Israel does in response, Israel is in the wrong. 
Let's talk a little bit about, well, we'll move on to RAFA, but also how important is RAFA to ensuring that Israel prevails here and that Hamas and its power structure is completely dismantled and its ability to regroup, you know, reform itself into some ability to be a more a, a fighting machine again. Particularly interesting because we see today in Starot and places, rockets are still coming over. We know that Al-Shifa Hospital, it seems that um, Hamas went back there thinking this was now done. And since they've been back there and the IDF have had a very successful operation against them, huge amount more arms have been discovered in, in that location. Um, so if they're able to do that whilst in, a, in what is now war zone, how important is it that Rafa, uh, 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 that Israel is able to uh, mount an operation in Rafa, or should they now step back and uh, find a settlement on this? I'll just say a word or two about the Shifa Hospital as you raised this, and I think we have seen as Israel's cleared areas of northern and central Gaza, they haven't been able to, mainly because they don't have a limitless supply of troops, they haven't been able to secure every piece of ground that they have cleared, and therefore Hamas has the ability to re-infiltrate or to emerge again uh, from hiding to, to carry out further attacks and activities in those areas. Now, we've seen that across the Gaza Strip, and as it occurs, the IDF have dealt with it. In Shifa, I think we've got a slightly different story, and my understanding is that the Shifa hospital operation that's going on now is actually a trap laid by Israel uh, to lure the terrorists back to where they were before and then deal with them as they've been dealing with them at Shifa. And it was, it, we've seen 150, I think, Hamas terrorists killed and hundreds captured. Of interest, I think, we've also, I've seen reports that Hamas terrorists have been fighting. And I saw a report today that Hamas terrorists have been fighting from an emergency room in Hamas a hospital against the IDF, that a Hamas uh, t suicide bomber detonated in a in a ward uh, in in a ho in, the, in the Shifa hospital, which killed, I think, uh, a number of patients, tens of patients, uh, and, and and wounded, and I think killed one Israeli soldier as well. So this is the way that Hamas is fighting. Israel is doing everything it can to avoid hurting the patients while trying to de destroy this terrorist body that's there. And, and Israel's even gone as far as to bring in uh, emergency supplies, medical supplies, food, water, et cetera, for the patients that remain in the hospital. And they haven't compelled them to evacuate. They've moved them around in some places, but they're fighting, uh, I think, a very, very effective battle in a, in a very, very difficult area uh, against an enemy that is certainly not unwilling to sacrifice the, the, the patients in that hospital. But going on to... Um, to Rafa. I think it was Benny Gantz, the, who's a member of the War Cabinet, a former IDF Chief of Staff, said, you, you, you don't put out 80% of a fire, you have to put out the whole fire. And that's really, I think that's quite a good uh, analogy for what's going on in Gaza. You, you, if, you, if you need to destroy an enemy that is intent on your destruction, then you can't just do, deal with part of it and, and, and leave the rest to to develop again and to strike again. And we've heard from Hamas, we've heard from Hamas leaders since the 7th of October that they will, if they're able to, they will do 7th of October again and again and again. And so that enclave, shall we say, in, in Rafa, the, the remaining te major terrorist enclave in Gaza, does have to be dealt with. It, it cannot simply be left. It will, if, if it is left um, un, unmolested, it will almost certainly rise up again. Now, you could say that even if even if the IDF go into Rafah and destroy the main Hamas fighting elements there, you could say that that's still not the end of Hamas. And, and I think that would probably be true. Uh, some people say you can't destroy an ideology. Well, you probably can't destroy an ideology. But, but as with, with Japan in 1945 and the Nazis in 1945, we destroyed those ideologies, capabilities of actually inflicting harm around the world and on their own people. So it, 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 is, it is possible militarily to, I think, neutralize the masses' capabilities by either killing or capturing or causing to flee the majority of their fighters, not 
but you can't do it just by leaving an enclave in Rafa. So I think the IDF does have to go into Rafa in force, not with targeted raids, although that will be an element of it, undoubtedly. But it does have to go into Rafa in force. And of course, there is then the the problem of the vast number of civilians that are there. They will have to be moved. They'll have to be evacuated somewhere uh, as soon as possible before the operation begins. Is that but, logistically possible to one 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 point two to one and a half million people? Yeah, I think I think it is logistically possible, logistically possible to move them to areas on the coast and maybe a little bit further north, although not fully up to up to the up into Khan Yunus, etc. But I think it is possible to move them out. Obviously, it's a big humanitarian aid problem. But the the obvious solution to the problem, of course, is one that the, the world is ignoring. And that is for Egypt to open its border and allow them to take temporary refuge in Sinai, which would be a very, very easy solution, moving them out of the way of harm, putting them in a place where humanitarian aid could very easily be provided to them. But of course, Egypt does not want to do that. And you can understand why Egypt doesn't want to do it as well. Everywhere that Palestinian uh, terrorist organizations have been, every country they've gone to, they have caused immense damage to those countries. So they obviously don't want to do that. But I think I think it's uh, it, it's in, in many ways the obvious solution. Uh, but the international community won't put pressure on Egypt to do that at all. And the US could easily get Egypt to do that with funds, etc. You have to wonder why people don't want to do it. And, and I think the, the, the answer is that they want Israel to be responsible for everything that happens. They don't want to share responsibility for what happens in relation to the Gaza population. And of course, you then get the conspiracy theories about this is Israel's objective to, to cleanse Gaza of the Palestinian population, which of course is a lie. But that, that would be the, the, the very, very obvious solution. Every other war I'm aware of, the world has always, uh, if, if neighboring countries have been unwilling, the world has always pressured them into opening their borders to allow people to escape. Not this one is unique, I think, in that respect. It is possible to evacuate many of the civilian population and then to launch a, an attack which finishes off the Hamas elements. It will not be without bloodshed. There's no question there, not just of Hamas terrorists, of course. So a large number of civilians are also likely to, to die but unfortunately, that is the tragic consequence of, of every war, particularly a war fought like this. Civilians do end up dying. And the, the alternative to that is that Israel remains extremely vulnerable to, to further attacks by Hamas. I'll just very briefly, if I may, mention one other alternative to that scenario to going into Rafah. And it's not necessarily an attractive one, but, but, but if, if it proved impossible for, whether for military reasons or reasons of international pressure for Israel not to do so, then it would be another alternative would be possible, which is to essentially to construct a strong defensive line from the coast to the Israeli border, parallel to the current Egyptian border, but about three kilometers in, which would put, which would effectively isolate Rafa. And so effectively you say this new defensive line would be, would become um, the new southern border of Gaza, and you isolate Rafa, and you don't allow anything to move without your authority north of this new line. And, and it still leaves a large element of Hamas intact. They could be dealt with maybe over a lengthy period on a piecemeal basis, not necessarily destroying them completely, but um, perhaps you know, targeting specific threats as and when they arise. But Hamas could do relatively, relatively little damage to Israel, to, to places like Sirot, to places like uh, Ashkelon and Ashdod from that very southernmost part of Gaza. So it would be a possibility. And it would have, the, the other thing it would do, it would basically make this enclave of Rafa Egypt's problem. That would be for Egypt to deal with now. Israel seals it off over to you, Egypt. Now, obviously, <laughs> Egypt is obviously not going to I don't think embrace that option very, very warmly because it would be a problem for them. But, but it is another, another possible option that, that might be, whether it's politically sellable in Israel, I don't know. I think militarily it is a possibility. I think what we'll do is, um, there's people who want to ask you questions.
So I'm going to go to the, uh, the members of the um, uh, uh, of the audience now and let them put some of their questions. Would you like to put your question to Richard? Well, I was I was just wondering what uh, your thoughts are about the UN resolution that was passed for the ceasefire and release of hostages and the U.S. abstention and the impact it will have uh, both on the war effort. Is there any chance of the hostages being released? and uh, also the impact in Europe uh, based on the United States abstention. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think uh, one, my, my, my immediate reaction to seeing this uh, resolution is that basically the UN has just thrown the Israeli hostages under the bus. Of course, they, they, they demand that hostages be released, but that means nothing. What, you know, since when does Hamas comply with anything the UN says or does? Um, not that the UN ever says anything against Hamas, of course. But um, the, 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 we're in the middle now of, of, I think, a very delicate negotiation over hostage release in exchange for a temporary ceasefire. And that, of course, has gone out the window because there is now no longer a bargaining chip. Uh, the, the UN has said that there must be a, a cessation of hostilities. So I think... Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think I think the the uh, the prospects, for example, of an exchange of Israeli prisoners for Hamas uh, captive for Hamas hostages is probably now disappeared. Um, uh, and obviously, that's I think very bad news for those hostages. Uh, I think the other most significant, or perhaps the single most significant mm -hmm. aspect of this UN resolution is that the U the US did not veto it for the first time. And that, that shows a very, very distinct deterioration in uh, U.S.-Israel relations. Israel is heavily dependent on the U.S. The U.S. so far in this conflict, despite some of the things they've said, have been extremely strong in backing mm -hmm. Israel in pretty much everything it's had to do uh, and have, have helped us facilitated a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, I, I make that I make that statement knowing that uh, that the you know various uh, U.S. politicians and officials have said things that might uh, contradict that, but I think that really was be was for not so much uh, having a practical effect on Israel's relations with the U.S. and with Israel's war, but uh, it, it, they're said in relation to the, you know the, the 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 perceived need by the Biden administration to. To, to to placate the uh, the anti-Israel voters in his electorate, but this is I think this is a different move now. This this will be this basically isolates Israel. Unfortunately, Britain as well uh, didn't just as the US did didn't just abstain from this resolution. Britain voted with it, which I think is a deep shame on the part of the UK, but not surprising in a way because of the UK's broad stance on on most things in the UN to do with Israel. Israel will have to think very carefully now about its future in relation to the US. We've seen already that Prime Minister Netanyahu has cancelled a delegation that was due led by Ron Derma due to go to Washington to discuss the RAFA operation with the US administration. That's now been cancelled. I hope that some form of repair might be possible to the relationship. But, of course, it, it's a very, to my mind, it's a very, very bad omen. And it might mean that Israel is going to have to simply grit its teeth now and hope for a different administration in Washington uh, in January. That's a very long time away, of course, and a great deal of damage could be done by that. The, as far as the, the, the actual effect of the resolution is concerned, as I said, Hamas are not going to release the hostages now just because the UN says so. And I would certainly hope Israel is not going to immediately implement a ceasefire just because the UN says so. That would be tantamount to surrender to Hamas. It has to keep fighting and has to keep destroying Hamas. And indeed, I think the US National Security Advisor did say after the resolution that a ceasefire couldn't occur before the ho before hostages are released, whether he meant all hostages or some hostages, I don't know. But it does show, I think, the US understands that this is not going to result in a an immediate cessation of hostilities by Israel. I would hope it doesn't anyway. I, I, another major damaging aspect of it, of course, is how it feeds the anti-Israel and anti-Jew propaganda around the world, which I spoke about a bit earlier on. But of course, 
Um, things like David Cameron, our foreign minister, uh, saying the other day that he that because of alleged breaches of international law by Israel, which in my view are certainly not the case, um, he was going to place an arms embargo on Israel. That immediately fuels a fire, immediately shows that the British government believes Israel uh, is guilty of war crimes. It doesn't show anything of the sort, but that's the effect of it. And this resolution will have a similar inflammatory effect on this horrific anti-Israel and anti-Jew campaign that's that's been really very, very badly affecting all of our countries. Uh, I've been in Israel for most of this war. I've been in the UK for the last few days, and I've spoken to quite a large number of Jews over here who are deeply, deeply upset by the threat they feel under on the streets of London by this campaign. Um, uh, and this can only make that worse. And of course, the number 10 spokesperson then uh, contradicted David Cameron to the extent uh, that they have no evidence that was broken international humanitarian law. And that's in your article, which is an amazing article, Richard. The UK threat to withhold Israel arms sales is a show of Western weakness. Perhaps we can come back to that in a minute, but would you like to put yes. your question to Richard? Please. Richard, one of my big questions is, do you have any suggestions on ways that we can start combating this mm. this PR war? Because that's what it is. <laughs> that's a good, thank you, Eileen, for that question. It's an easy one, of course. It's a question I get asked a lot. And th the reality is, it shouldn't. It's not really a case of beginning to combat this war. I think there have been a lot of organisations, not least Elnet, that have been involved, in, involved for a long time in in trying to counter this this narrative, this propaganda. Um, the, the 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 tragic reality is that it's a very very strong campaign. As I said before, it it goes back decades. In fact, it started with an anti-Israel propaganda campaign that was devised, devised in the Kremlin back in the 1960s. And it's been built on that. A lot of the slogans you hear on the streets of London or New York or wherever um, are the same slogans as were written down in the Kremlin. And, and so today's university students are, are parroting Soviet propaganda lines even today, though they don't know it. Um, so it's, it's very powerful, very strong. Uh, and it's it's extremely hard to combat. But the the only, the only thing I would say is that everyone who has who 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 sees reason, who understands reason, and and has a voice, whether it's on social media, in mainstream media, among political leaders, uh, in in international bodies, human rights groups, etc. Anyone who has a voice, I believe, has a responsibility and a duty, not just a responsibility, but a duty to. To, to first of all to call it out and secondly to correct it because most of what is said i i spend a lot of time looking at this stuff most of it is lies and provable lies which can be countered it's not easy when you've got such a weight of uh of um power on the other side including in many of our mainstream media organizations which very often parrot a lot of this stuff uh, and, and there are very few, there are very few voices, I think, you know, establishment voices, which, um, which, uh, are, are willing to, to, to take it on. And of course, you know, I, just as an example, on, I, I, I'm fairly active on Twitter. And every time I post something on Twitter on Israel, I will get about 90 to 95% of responses are totally opposed, normally vitriolic but definitely opposed with a very small amount supporting. And I do have quite a large number of pro-Israel followers as well. So I think that 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 tells a little bit of a story. But one, one other thing I would say is that the British government, when, we, when the war began in Ukraine, the British government recognized early on that this was gonna be a difficult war. It was going to, uh, the, the results of Putin's actions and our counteractions, including international sanctions, were going to make life hard in economic terms for British people. And they they decided, the government made a decision that in order to justify what was happening and to justify the vast amount of expenditure we were making on supporting Ukraine, to launch a very effective PR campaign, which was carried out 
by the British go by British government ministries, including the MOD, the Home Office, etc., uh, and also uh, you know, took hold in the media because of that. And it, and it essentially has created a very, very, I think, a very, very powerful voice um, to tell the truth about Ukraine, or at least what the British government understands to be the truth. I, I believe that the British government should do the same in relation to Israel, not to be the the mouthpiece of Israel, but to be um, a source of truth as opposed to lies. Because some people, even today, some people do believe what the British government says, and it has effect. So I think there is a responsibility to 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 to, to create a similar kind of campaign in the UK, in the US, and elsewhere as well. Um, to to get the truth out to 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 um to 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 not just to help to hopefully help defend and Britain has helped defend Israel in in the Gaza war in a number of different military ways and intelligence ways but also to help fight this propaganda battle hi there thank you for being here colonel so we in the united states and everywhere uh, see a lot of protests that are uh, quite large ha- And we've heard about uh, members of parliament actually being um, threatened with physical harm. How do you think that that affects the the legislation that comes through the parliament and and all of the uh, European countries? Uh, I'm not so sure about legislation, but but I certainly think that it affects the the message and the dialogue coming from our governments. And I think one of the reasons that David Cameron in Britain spoke about the... In, imposing an arms embargo on Israel and essentially suggesting that Israel may be breaking international law. I think that is about, or has a great deal to do with, the 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 the, the pressure that he sees on the streets, from the streets and from various media organizations. And like, you know, as I, I mentioned before, that in the United States, a lot of what the Biden administration has been saying about Israel is aimed really at uh, placating the U.S. electorate that is opposed to the elements of the U.S. electorate that are opposed to Israel. It's the same here. We've got an election coming up as well, probably in the same kind of time frame as the U.S. elections. And the, the government obviously wants to uh, garner uh, non uh, you know, anti-Israel vo- votes as well as pro-Israel votes. And so that, that has influenced, you know, the, the, the the, the, the regular street protests, the noise you get in the media and elsewhere has, I think, influenced what the government does and the government messaging. And as Joan pointed, pointed out, it's slightly confused because the prime minister said Israel's not committing war crimes and the foreign secretary, in pretty much the same breath, almost said they are committing war crimes. So, again, you know, this, this is probably talking to both both elements of the electorate in a way. But I think I think the uh, another example. I don't want to go into detail on this. I'm sure you may have heard of it. Another example is when when um, the speaker recently in a, in a in a debate on a uh, I think it was an opposition day uh, debate in Parliament in, in the House of Commons. He broke parliamentary rules and caused uproar and apologised for it afterwards and explained his um, his decision by in part at least, not wanting to endanger MPs uh, who are subject to sometimes hate campaigns and violence by anti-Israel people on our streets. That is another, I think, example, if if that was true, of the way it's being influenced. I do do think just a a quick word here, I think, on on the British political scene, and I'm not a political person myself at all. I'm not a member of any party, and I don't don't have a particular political persuasion, but I, I have been quite surprised by the Labour Party's strong stance in, in favour of Israel, supporting the government line in effect since the 7th of October, which has been very, very useful. But again, I believe that that is primarily motivated by electoral considerations. And, and I'm, I'm fearful that if and when a Labour government comes into power, all of the backbench MPs, the councillors, the, some of the shadow cabinet members who have been biting their tongues on Israel for all this time will realise they no longer have to do so. And I, I really do have a fear that under a Labour government, that, is, that the UK will, will soon become one of Israel's worst enemies in Europe. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I do fear that's going to be the case. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Joan, very much. By the way, um, I think the answer to win the propaganda war 
is to have the colonel as the uh, anchorman for Hamas Broadcasting TV, otherwise known as BBC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the PR. But anyway, no, my question is, is this. On the um, Egyptian side of the Rafa border, border, I am told, or rumor has it, that there is a relatively large town, city being built there. Is there any truth to this? And is there any truth that perhaps um, some of the uh, Gazan refugees may be housed there? Thank you very much, my Lord. It's a pleasure to see you yet again uh, in your, in your uh, palace, wherever you are in deepest uh, West country. I, I should just, on the BBC, I should say I'm, I've become a human shield for the BBC. The BBC has, uh, for about the last decade and a half, the BBC has never allowed me to speak about Israel. They, they, I speak quite frequently on interviews in relation to Ukraine, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, other security issues, but not Israel, because I, 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 I don't conform with their, their narrative on that. But I got a call um, a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, asking news channel asked me to do an interview for them which i did and i did a few others after that and i wonder what this is all about and i then suddenly realized it was in in the wake of criticism of the bbc for their reporting of the al ali hospital their allegation that israel carried out the attack when it when it was islamic jihad and i think they must have decided that that they would show even handedness by having an extremist like me <laughs> speaking on their news program but um in, in, direct, in answer to your, your specific question, I, I also understand that um, a, 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 some form of, of encampment has been established on the Egyptian side of the border. Now, what I don't know, of course, is whether there is some arrangement with Israel that we don't know about that may lead to them allowing out some of the refugees if and when Israel goes into Rafah, because... You know, I, I was pretty critical of, of Egypt uh, when I when I said they wouldn't allow refugees in, but I do understand why. But I also know that Israel, that Egypt and Israel have been cooperating extremely closely in this conflict. Uh, and I was speaking recently to uh, a couple of generals inside Gaza who were singing the praises of Egypt's cooperation. And of course, um, that that also applies to most other Middle Eastern countries: UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Um, uh, Oman, Bahrain, etc., who who have been very supportive of Israel behind the scenes, not necessarily in public. So that would not really surprise me enormously if that was to be the case. Or alternatively, it may simply be that Israel or that Egypt rather believes they might simply be faced with a deluge of refugees who get through their border uh, and they have to do something with. So I, I don't I don't really know the answer, but I think it's one of those two possibly. Wonderful comments, sir. You're just an excellent speaker and expert on all matters around this. I do want to challenge your assertion that any linkage of uh, Israel's position with uh, what's going on in Ukraine would be helpful. If the Biden administration had not linked financing for Ukraine for finance without financing to Israel, Israel would have had all the money in the world that needed, you know, in November in order to conduct this war uh, uh, in Gaza vastly more quickly, vastly more effectively, probably saving many lives. So I don't I don't see a PR campaign that leagues the two as being helpful. I, I want your feedback on that, please, sir. Yeah, I mean, I just say I, I wasn't advocating a PR campaign that links the two at all. I, I was I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, but I was suggesting that the British government had launched a very effective PR campaign to support its support of the war in Ukraine, of Ukrainians. Uh, and they should maybe try and do a similar campaign in relation to Israel, but not link, not at all linking the two. Having said that, I, just a, a very brief comment on your other observation that I, I don't think, I mean, I may be mistaken here, but I don't believe that Israel has significantly suffered as a result of the linkage of um, US funding for Ukraine and Israel. I, I, I know that it was done. I think it's now been, as I understand it, that deadlock has now been broken, but I could be wrong there. But I don't think Israel has significantly suffered. Having said that, 
it does need more ammunition. It needs more ammunition fast. And anything that can be done by the US to get that ammunition to Israel, particularly with an eye on what may be happening up in Lebanon before too too much longer, I think uh, it would be very, very welcome in, in Israel. Just wanted to thank you, Colonel, for your very astute observations. And uh, I've been reading your things for, for some time, but um, I just, I'll just i try to make this quick. Um, Israel's a very small country, kind of limited bandwidth for anything I guess it attempts to do. So with so much attention, so much of its attention being focused on the war with Hamas and the impending war against Hezbollah, do you have any sense that Israel has not lost sight of the of the main event? That is the the, the further the rapid completion and development of Israel of Iran's um, a deliverable nuclear weapon. I mean, that's really at the end of the day. That's what it's all about here. I mean, these other things can be dealt with, you know, on a on a on a longer basis. But they've got to deal with that. That's what's feeding all these other proxies. Have they lost sight of that in your in your view, or is that still very much, you know, do they have the the bandwidth to continue to focus on that? Yeah, I, I got a very good question. I think I think Iran is very much center stage in Israel now. I was I had a meeting with the Israeli uh, defense minister about a week or so ago, who and it was very very uppermost in his mind, as it as it is with pretty much every other Israeli official from the government that I've met. They're very fixed on that. They, they of course, understand that, that this whole war and what's going on in Lebanon and the Houthis and, and every other element of this war uh, is is under the control of Iran, is is, an, is part of the, Iran's war on Israel. Um, but, of course, the, you, you, I think you're specifically alluding to the nuclear program, and Israel's got a very close eye on it. What, what, what and at what point Israel will find a need to take action, more action they've already taken. Of course, they have been taking significant action against the the program for, for a long time. But I don't think, I certainly don't think it's gone out of their minds. Uh, but I do, I, one thing I would say is that I think there is there is some uh, hope, shall we say, in Israel. And I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that um, either the defense minister or any of the other ministers are um, uh, necessarily a, a supporters of Donald Trump, but I do, I do think there is some optimism that um, if Trump comes back to the White House, that the era of appeasing Iran, which we've seen from the start of the Biden administration, may well disappear, and that might give them the opportunity to to take action along with the U.S. against Iran, which I think is something that would be needed in order to have a decisive result there. But I. I Obviously, again, that you know that that's a long way away if it happens, and it's um, a, a lot could happen. Iran has been moving very quickly on the nuclear program, uh, so I think you know. But I, I would I I rest you I'd, re- I'd be rest assured that uh, it's certainly not out of the Israeli government's mind. With thanks to Elnet UK, a non-profit organisation dedicated to strengthening relations between Europe and Israel based on shared democratic values and strategic interests.